Hello, I'm Joshua from Authentic Aquatics, and in this video I'm going to be talking about convict cichlids. Now, convict cichlids are fantastic beginner fish. They're very hardy, very hard to kill. They allow for a lot of uh, variant sway in your water stability. Uh, and in addition, for those of you who really want to breed something and you don't want to spend a lot of money doing it, convict cichlids are very easy to breed. As you see here, I have uh, I think 93 fry in here that are at two months old and then I have week old fry in here and one I think there's somewhere around 150 in there so we got these back in January uh, January 9th we bought the convict cichlids this is already their third batch of babies so it's uh, it's a very fast breeding fish very prolific uh, and they actually do take care of their fry, which is why the parents are still in there with their fry. Um, fantastic parents for a while. I will warn you that eventually you are going to have to be able to separate your parents from your babies. So these fish might start taking up spare tanks. So just a warning there. So to get right into it, convict cichlids, or zebra cichlids as they're also called, are from Central America and they're cave breeders. So, word of warning, uh, I use convicts because they're so hardy and I wanted something easy to breed. I use them to cycle my planted aquarium here. I'm going to warn you right now, I thought that um, I had seen a few warnings on the internet that they do dig a little bit. And I said, okay, if I give them a few caves, they'll move around the gravel a little bit, maybe make a little burrow, and that'll be all it is. That is not the case. They will dig everything out down to the glass of the aquarium. So what you see here is a lot of restoration work after having convict cichlids living in there for over a month. Um, we finally moved the convict cichlids out of there when their babies were starting to get pretty big and we noticed that they were becoming aggressive to the babies. So are they for planted aquariums or even to cycle a dirted tank? No they're not. I would have strongly advised against it Go get something simple, just go get feeder fish from your local fish store, just throw them in there, cycle it that way, or start with a hardier tetra or whatever you're going to put in your planter tank. Just find the hardiest species you want in there and cycle it with that. Um, convict cichlids, although they're great at cycling other things because they just, they live through any water parameter shifts. They just, they're fantastic at not dying. They're just really hardy fish. So, are they good for cycling aquariums? Absolutely. Dirted tanks, not so much, because you're going to do a lot of restoration. And as you can see, I still have some dirt that they've dug up in the back that I'm still siphoning out. So, word of caution. Uh, I always say do your research. I did not do enough research. So, but it wasn't that big a deal. I make it sound worse than it was, but still save yourself the trouble. Do it with just a normal gravel tank or a bare bottom tank. The second note on convict cichlid compatibility is they are convicts. They belong in their own little jail tank over here. Because the thing with convicts, if you don't have a tank that's over 30 gallons, you don't want to keep anything smaller in there with them, even with the fry. Convict cichlids are both your dither and your main fish, because they will terrorize anything smaller than them to death. Even the little ones if I were to put another fish in here, they would gather and they would nip at any fish of a different species. The only things you should keep with convict cichlids are larger South American cichlids that have more aggressive tendencies. Because convict cichlids are so brutal that they can fight off Oscars. There's been stories of them literally fighting off Oscars. Then when you put two convict cichlids together and they're breeding, not even their own last batch of fry is safe. They will begin to destroy their own last batch of fry to protect their new eggs. So that's where their great parenting just takes a nosedive. So now that we've talked about their hardiness and their lack of compatibility, let's start talking about what most people are watching this video for, and that's how to breed convict cichlids. Obviously, the first step in the breeding process is to determine your breeding pair. So you need to know how to sex your individual fish. So when you go to the pet store, this is what you're going to be looking for. As you can see in this picture, the female has 
orange on her belly. It's more defined when she's uh, about to breed, but otherwise she always has it. Um, and then she also has a little, a little bit of blue tint to her uh, fins. The male, on the other hand, is going to have a little bit of pink tint to his fins. Um, I've never really seen it, but it, I've been told it's there. The other thing that you can look for is if you look at the back fins of both fish, the females tend to get picked on by the males who really want to breed. So the males are going to have more uh, long flowing anal and dorsal fins where the females might look a little bit picked on. They might be a little bit rounded as opposed, as opposed to pointed because they're healing. So that's not a sure-fired way of looking at it, but it is a way of looking at it. Also, the male at a um, older age is going to develop a fatty lump like a lot of uh, South American cichlids on his head and that is a sure-fired way of telling if it's a male or female. Otherwise you're gonna have to sort of look at the young males and say okay this one's slightly bigger than the female because they do get to a larger size and you're also going to have to say um, this one has lesser colors around his stomach he doesn't have as defined lines so therefore I assume this is a male. And it's really not that hard. It sounds a lot harder uh, saying it orally than actually doing it, but uh, I hope that was at least helpful so that you could sort of get an idea of what you're looking for. And to be honest, there's a saying, all you have to do is add water, and it holds firm. These fish, like I said, are prolific breeders. You give them anything to breed on, they will lay eggs on it. So I don't really have to give a lot of information on how to breed them, what I'd rather give is sort of a game plan. A lot of people going into this say, oh, well, they're South American cichlids. They're going to raise their babies. This will be fine. I'm going to tell you that I think there is a bit more prep to it than that because we need to know where to house the babies. We have to know how to house the adults. And we also have to have a game plan in between how we're going to shift things around because these babies are catching up to those babies at a rather fast rate before I'm going to be able to get these out of here. And guess what? When I'm getting these things out of here, they're going to be a dime a dozen. So if you're doing this for money, mm -mm. I know where I'm going to send mine, and that's the only reason I did it, because I had a way to get rid of them. A lot of times, these guys are going to end up as feeder fish at a pet store. Or you're going to sell them in bulk to someone who's going to use them as feeder fish, which is why I grow mine a little bit larger, because I want them to be sold in a pet store as pets. Just for my own personal fact that I've had uh, this much fun raising them, that's what I really want to get them to, therefore I want to take them that extra step. But a lot of people want to have them, get them to about this size and unload them, which I'm going to warn you right now is very difficult. So if you're not ready to be overwhelmed by a ton of fish because these things are breeding, you know, first batch 100, next batch 150, if you're not ready for that, it's going to catch you off guard. So we're going to talk about game plans to sort of offset this. So all of that being said, I want to tell you what I did, and then you can sort of make your hobby from there. Because it's really up to you. These fish offer a lot of diverse setups, and you can sort of play it how you want. And so I just want to give one opinion of how to do it, but that's certainly not the only opinion. So what I did was... At first, I just raised everything in the display tank. I don't do that now because, like I said, it took a lot of restoration to get the tank looking back like this, and I didn't want the parents picking on the, uh, on the fry. Also, I wanted the 20-gallon for the, for, the, for the fry grow-out tank because there were so many of them, and then I wanted the parents just to be in a 10-gallon that was easily cleanable and easy to catch fry. So. I would suggest to you that for the parent's tank, you set up just a 10 gallon tank, you monitor it so that if the uh, parents start getting aggressive towards one another, you can counter that. You don't want the male killing the female, for example. But all you have to do is set it up with a little bit of filtration. For when the parents are alone, I like a hang on back filter with just activated carbon or not even that, you could just do uh, some sort of filter floss or if you wrap pantyhose around uh, some sort of setting to go in there, that'll catch all you need and you can clean that regularly and that gives you some sort of mechanical filtration, if not chemical and biological, if you're using that sort of method to... Um, but a better method of biological filtration that you can use 
with the babies is a sponge filter. So I suggest that the tank have one of those because it won't suck the babies in on like a hang on back filter. So keep that in mind. The other thing is as they're cave breeders, you really want to put something like flower pot in the tank so that they can use that for their breeding uh, substrate or their surface. So that's what I like to do. After I start see a, seeing aggression from the parents toward the fry, I get the parents out of there first because if you disturb the tank too much, the parents, hoping to save most of the fry, will eat many of them. They'll start chowing down, becoming cannibal, because they're figuring out that if we decrease the number of fry that we have, then this predator might go away. It won't be as enticing. So they'll do that as sort of a defense mechanism. But you don't want that. So what you do is you first go after the parents, catch both of them, put them in a spare bucket, put them in a bag, then you go after all the fry, which are easy to get out if you have a bare bottom tank, where if you have gravel, they're much more difficult to get at. So after you've caught them all off the bare bottom with a net, you put them in this. And this is just a simple uh, breeder net, a breeder cage, depending on what you want to call it. And you can grow your fry in here. It's nice because you can hang it still in the parents' tank. Uh, the parents, uh, I've had this up there, convicts cannot rip through this model. There might be some flimsier models that they might be able to, but this has held them at bay. You can suction cup it right onto the wall. I'd say give some support underneath just in case the suction cup gives way. And that way, you can put the fry in here and they can grow a little bit because they always live in a, a big bundle of fry anyway. They're always swarming as uh, fry. So this will be all right. You can target feed them. The parents won't steal all the food. Parents won't be bullying. The parents can start worrying about their next batch while your fry are growing. Then once your fry have reached a reasonable size, you can put them in your grow out tank, which depending on how big you want your fry to be, they'll have to be a bigger tank. I'm expecting to keep these fry maybe a month or two more before I let this group go. Some of them are at an inch, so if I wanted to grow them to the full size, this isn't going to work because convict cichlids get easily uh, females three to four and then males five and then they get that big lump on their head uh, which adds a little bit of girth. So. That being said, you need big tanks if you want to grow them to full size, which is where you're really going to get your value back for them. To clarify, I said that your parents are eventually going to start hurting your fry. You want to find out when your parents are going to mate again and get your fry out before then. What I suggest is you look for a dance that looks like this. When you see this, that's time for you to start moving your fry, which means I'm going to have to move my fry very soon into my uh, breeder box. What's going to end up happening is these parents are soon going to lay another batch of eggs and when they do, they're going to either start eating or chasing their fry to death. So when they start eating the fry, they do that for many reasons. One, to protect the eggs. Two, because they need nourishment. They're putting out so much energy to clean the surfaces, to, especially for the female, to actually lay the eggs that they're going to need nutrients and they're going to take nutrients from their old fry. So Keep that in mind, look for this behavior, learn what your individual couple's behavior is, and start to identify that so that you can be more effective at keeping your fry alive. Now when it comes to fry, I like convict cichlid fry um, just because they're so convenient. Unlike something like angelfish fry, which I love angelfish, don't get me wrong, convict cichlid fry are born large enough to eat flake food right off the bat. All you have to do is crush flake food in between your fingers, put it in, and literally two-day-old fry are ready to start eating uh, that kind of, just eating normal flake food, which is fantastic. It's very easy. You don't have to go with something uh, more difficult like baby brine shrimp. You don't have to waste as much money because you can buy something as simple as the Tetra just from your local Walmart or your pet's supermarket or your pet smart or wherever you go. It's super easy. So when it comes down to it, like I said, convict cichlid, even as fry, are hardy. They're very easy to maintain in terms of feeding. And on top of that, they're prolific. So if you really just want to sort of have a conveyor belt going, you can do that. On a darker note, one thing that convict cichlid fry are really good for is if you keep a, 
a pair of convict cichlids in the sump of your tank or in some sort of reservoir, when they reproduce, their fry will sort of disperse throughout your tank. So, if you wanted something that would feed some of your uh, other fish, maybe you have a larger fauna and you want to do something more of that, um, that would be some, that's within the realm of possibilities you can do because they're so prolific. So every two weeks, your fish would get live food. Um, like I said, a little bit darker, but that is some of the more uh, experienced aquarists do actually do that uh, just to give their uh, fish some more diversity in their diet. So the very last thing I'm going to say is that temperature wise doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter as long as you're not letting it freeze of course. If you're running it anywhere from I'm going to say 72 degrees up to 90 degrees your fish are going to do fine. I've run it everywhere in between there and I have almost no fatalities among the fry, obviously no fatalities in the adults. I've had them up at 95 I think by accident. I turned up everything and I didn't have a uh, thermometer at the time and lo and behold I put a thermometer in there and found that I was raising them at 95 and believe it or not they grew better at 95 degrees than they have at 80. I'm not saying that's proven fact, just something that I saw that it seemed like at higher temperatures they eat a lot more therefore they grow a little bit more um, but of course when you start bringing up those temperatures you need to provide a lot more oxygen because it escapes from the water a lot quicker so that's really all I have to say uh, convict cichlids are not difficult fish to care for or breed but I hope this has helped you in any way as always I'm so thankful for you uh, tuning into the video and I just want to say that in the coming week I will be doing another video on this fine piece of equipment here and this is just a DIY uh, overflow for a 20 gallon tank so I'm going to give you exact measurements uh, for this. It's been done several times by other people but I noticed that they didn't exactly give step-by-step -step instructions on the, how to build it so I'm going to piece by piece put this together, drill holes into it and this is going to be for 20 gallons so I'll give you measurements and accords to that so that you can set this up on your own tank. It might be a little bit of overkill on a 20 gallon tank but hey, you know, uh, if you want to do something fancy this is your place to start. In addition, if you want to see a special video for donors uh, to my channel, there is a nuisance algae video that I made and I'll have my little box right up here. As always, your support is always appreciated and it enhances future content. So thank you so much for watching. Definitely subscribe if you found this video helpful and I'll see you again next week. Until then, wishing you and your aquariums the best.